to introduce the second speaker and then of course uh, to handle the, any questions as well as introduce the college lecturer today i hand over to dr dubinda basinga my colleague uh, from the is the president of the college of specialists in rheumatology and rehabilitation dr dubinda if you can take over from now thank you thank you very much arusha uh, i thank first uh, college uh, college of physicians for inviting us to do this forum so our second speaker is dr manjula rana singh huh? uh he graduated from university of ruhuna and currently he is a uh, senior registrar in nephrology at sri jayawardenepura hospital and he will be talking to us about managing an adult with nephrotic syndrome uh, over to you manjula thank you sir for the kind introduction and good afternoon everyone so the topic is managing an adult with nephrotic syndrome so first of all before we move on to the management what is this nephrotic syndrome it's actually a constellation of clinical and laboratory features which related to a kidney disease and it has three main features first one is the heavy proteinuria which is uh, measured in terms of 24 hour urine collection to be more than 3.5 grams or urine protein creatinine ratio above 3 grams per gram and peripheral edema and hypoalbuminemia this constellation of these uh, clinical and laboratory features are present we can call it as nephrotic syndrome so in terms of uh, classifying nephrotic syndrome in terms of etiology we can be uh, simply classify as primary and secondary nephrotic syndrome there are numerous primary uh, nephrotic syndromes namely minimum change disease uh, membranous nephropathy f FSGS, MPGN, and the list goes on. And there are secondary uh, nephrotic syndrome, which nephrotic syndrome occurs due to a primary some other uh, disease, commonly diabetes, systemic lupus erythematosus, and infections, especially some of the chronic uh, viral infections, including hepatitis, hepatitis B, C, HIV, and some bacterial infections, including infective endocarditis and fungal infections. and there are numerous other causes for secondary and primary uh, secondary uh, causes of nephrotic syndrome so what is the importance now if it's the primary nephrotic syndrome is a different management it's mainly due to immune suppression but if it's a secondary uh, cause of uh, nephrotic syndrome it's mainly we have to manage the primary disease which is causing the nephrotic syndrome so it's Uh, when it comes to adults nephrotic syndrome the renal biopsy is very important this will help to identify the type if it's a primary nephrotic syndrome it will help to identify the type of nephrotic syndrome as well as it is also important in assessing the activity and the chronicity that means from histological point of view we can assess how much chronic damage that the kidney has already had and how much active activity is there uh, can be assessed by renal renal biopsy but if you look at the childhood nephrotic syndrome i mean uh, pediatric nephrologists will rather would not proceed with a uh, renal biopsy because 90% of the pediatric population the cause is minimum change disease so they would tend to go ahead with the uh, immunosuppressive and then assess rather than going to a renal biopsy in first place but when it comes to adults it's very important to proceed with the renal biopsy to come to a exact diagnosis of what this nephrotic syndrome is so with the renal biopsy you can do light uh, histology can be assessed by light microscopy as well as electron microscopy and more advanced studies such as a uh, immunofluorescence staining can also be performed so as i mentioned earlier proteinuria is another important element in nephrotic syndrome so it's important to assess the degree of proteinuria correctly because that will aid us in uh, coming to the final diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome this is because proteinuria has uh, will be affected by several factors which include how how uh, with the exertion the proteinuria might differ and with the, the patient's posture it might differ so due to these factors you can go ahead with a 24 hour urine sample collection but however it's the urine is measured by patient so they tend to make mistakes 
So the 24 hour, you, rather than a 24 hour urine collection, it's now preferred to uh, assess with the urine protein creatinine ratio. And as I mentioned earlier, it, the protein urea is uh, affected by the circadian rhythm and the amount of exertion that the patient has. So if you're going for a UPCR assessment, it's best if you can try to attempt, ask the patient to attempt to take a 12 to 24 hour collection and then take a sample of that and assess the UPCR. But if it is impractical, at least proceeding with the first morning void sample to assess the UPCR is preferred. So in the line of investigation, there are several other investigations which include serological assessment to identify any secondary causes namely ANA, C3, C4, and cryoglobulin, and uh, assessment of viral, uh, viral status is also important, which I will not go into detail in this discussion. Okay, with that introduction, coming to the management aspects. Now, the management of nephrotic syndrome is maybe a little complex, but uh, easing it out, we have to manage the patient's symptoms. Edema is one of the main features in nephrotic syndrome, so symptomatic management will be important. And there are numerous complications which the patient might have in relation to nephrotic syndrome, and it is important for us to address these complications and to prevent them. Some of these include the thrombosis, the high infection risk, the high cardiovascular disease risk, and, uh, and the concerns with related to uh, reproductive health. So all these needs to be addressed. But when it comes to the definitive management, it's, uh, it, it's, this is where it is a bit complex because uh, in if it's a primary uh, nephrotic syndrome, the immunosuppression comes in place. If it's secondary nephrotic syndrome, the management is causing the primary disease which is causing the nephrotic syndrome. So there are only few studies which related to primary uh, nephrotic syndrome management and it's mainly based on the practical expertise, expertise and the available evidence. So I will not go into discussion on primary, the definitive management with related to the nephrotic syndrome because it's a very vast uh, area and the time does not permit here. But rather we will discuss about the general principles in management of nephrotic syndrome with related to symptomatic management and the prevention of complications. Right. So uh, proteinuria is one of the main feature of uh, nephrotic syndrome. We know that proteinuria could be a glomerular pathology, tubular pathology, or due to overflow. In nephrotic syndrome, the pathology is related to the glomerular proteinuria leak. So the damage here is towards the podocytes. There are several methods of damage to the podocytes. The podocytes may get effaced, and there may be a uh, disruption at the slit diaphragm, which is indicated here. If it, there's a disruption here, the protein would leak from the blood into the urine. And there might be depletion of these number of uh, podocytes. So this can happen with some antibody mediated uh, damage. Sometimes it could be toxin related, maybe heavy metals causing damage to the podocytes. And sometimes it is hereditary where where well, there may be uh, mutations in the proteins which encode the uh, uh, gene mutations which encode podocyte protein, which leads to depletion or defective podocytes. So why it's important to reduce the proteinuria and nephrotic syndrome? Well, obviously it will reflect the control of the primary disease. And by reducing the proteinuria, we also reduce the degree of glomerular hypertension. That means if, if it is persistent, it will damage the glomeruli and the patient has, is at a risk of going into developing CKD. And controlling protein will also reduce podocyte damage where the primary uh, pathology is. So to treat the protein we'll have actually we'll have to treat the underlying cause of nephrotic syndrome. So it's the primary one, immunosuppression will come in place. But we do have some medications which uh, which are helpful in reducing the, uh, the degree of protein, especially the AC inhibitors or the ARPs. They have the uh, ability to reduce the protein for about 40%. And, uh, and it can be started in 
these nephrotic, uh, nephrotic patients in view of reducing protein impact. But sometimes you might have some contraindications to AC inhibitors or ARBs. So in that place, second line uh, antiprotein drugs such as the calcium channel blockers, especially DLTSM or verifumin can be used. Right. What about the hyponatremia? How are we gonna address the hyponatremia? So before that, the exact cause of hyponatremia is still a bit uh, of a gray area. Because uh, if you take, it's obvious that the, the urine patients lose protein in nephrotic syndrome, but when compared to the amount of urine loss in urine, the patients are usually more hypoalbuminic than they're supposed to be. So there are some theories that other than just losing protein from the urine, there are theories that protein might be metabolized in, while in the urine by the uh, tubules, tubules in the uh, kidney. And there, may, there, there are theories that the cytokines, the inflammatory cytokines, which occur due to the nephrotic syndrome will affect the hepatic albumin synthesis. So in combining of all these factors, they will have a significant degree of hypoalbuminemia. So one would think that, okay, we can give some IV albumin to top up the uh, hypoalbuminemia in these patients. But if we, if we can give, but it's only a transient effect. We will, we will in, increase the uh, albumin in the blood for temporary, but whatever we give, so we in, the blood, in the urine. And in secondly, what about the place for supplementary protein? Again, whatever protein we're gonna give will be lost in the urine. So uh, there's no place for supplementary protein in nephrotic syndrome, and we would rather go for an adequate protein diet for these patients. So if you want to address the hyperalbinia, we should reduce the amount of protein and control the nephrotic syndrome is the best option. Okay, coming to the uh, symptomatic management. So the main feature of this nephrotic syndrome is they have edema. There are two hypotheses put, put forward. One is the overfill hypothesis and the underfill hypothesis. The overfill hypothesis is where we, you get the intrinsic renal tubular defect is there. So sodium is retained uh, due to the tubular defect. And as a consequence, the intravascular volume gets expanded. And this expanded volume then starts to leak into the intestinum thus causing uh, edema. So in these, uh, these kind of patients, they will have a high degree of ANP, theoretically. And the other hypothesis is underfill hypothesis, where due to the proteinuria, you get the low, hypo al low albumin levels in the blood, sorry, and low plasma oncotic pressure will proceed. With that, with the derangement of derangement pressure, gradient, the fluid will move from vascular space to the intestine. This will cause edema as well as it will activate the renin aldosterone and aldosterone system. So these patients will have increased renin activity and aldosterone. Uh, 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 so I think two hypotheses are there to explain the edema in nephrotic syndrome. So why is it important? So one, so some patients will have I, patients will have either one of these mechanisms. And uh, commonly, the adults tend to have the overfill hypothesis and children tend to have the underfill hypothesis. But this can vary. And sometimes the patient which initially will have another one hypothesis, with time they will change into the other hypothesis. So is it practical to find out whether these patients are having, which patient is having which hypothesis to cause the edema? Well, that will warrant us to check the renin activity, aldosterone, and AMP levels. We know that uh, even in advanced settings, this is a bit impractical. So in managing, uh, there are several aspects in generally how to manage the edema. So when a nephrotic patient is there, the patient is edematous, we tend to think, okay, we can restrict the amount of fluid that the patient is getting. But assume that the patient might be in uh, might be having a volume depletion if they are in an underfill hypothesis, right? So their volume is depleted, and if you are going to give diuretics later, that will further worsen the volume status, and the patients are more prone to dehydration. 
So in that case, it's not advised to restrict the amount of water that they should get unless the patient has hyponatremia. So we should not restrict for, uh, water intake in nephrotic syndrome. Of course, restricting salt is very beneficial, at least to less than two grams per day. And our first line therapeutic option would be to go with loop diuretics. Now, it's important to know the action of these loop diuretics. They are, they are dependent on the amount of protein in your, in your blood. The loop diuretics are bound to protein, and if you have low, less amount of albumin in the blood, less loop diuretics is delivered to the kidney. So the action is much impaired. And even though when you're, you administer it to the kidney, it gets uh, filtered to the glomeruli, and in the tubules, the, there's protein. Area. So these loop diuretics again bind to these proteins, and the action is impaired because they, they tend to remain inactive and they're bound to protein. So if you're gonna give loop diuretics, you should start off with a higher dose, not the 20 or 40s, rather than you should start off a dose of at least 80, 420 BD doses. You can start with oral and oral loop diuretics. Sometimes is even though you give loop diuretics, patients tend to have resistant edema. They're not responding to loop diuretics. At this point, you can add a second line diuretics. Preferred is a thiazide. Now, thiazides will go and block the distal convoluted tubule and will impair the sodium reabsorption there. So, we are going to block the loop of Fendley as well as the distal convoluted tubule. That means you get a more water loss and sodium loss. So, it's, if you are going for the combined diuretics, it's preferred that you give the thiazide diuretics at least two to five hours prior to administering loop diuretics. Okay, you're giving combined diuretics, but still the patient is having resistant edema. Then you can consider going for IV continuous infusions of loop diuretics, because continuous inf infusions are preferred than intermittent IV doses because it's less toxic to the patient and it has a more sustained effect. So even you administer all these therapeutic machines, still the patient might be resistant and they may be uh, having edema. So in that place, we can switch to IV albumin, especially in patients who are deficient with albumin. As I mentioned earlier, albumin is needed to the effect of loop diuretics to enhance. And it's preferred if we can give an IV albumin prior to giving the loop diuretics, the loop diuretic effect will be maximized. And also to control edema, you have the AC inhibitors or ARB, which will inhibit the renin aldosterone system. And as well as they have added benefits, they will also uh, involve in slowing the progression of kidney disease as well. Right, so another complication that these nephrotic patients will have is they, they are at a high risk of cardiovascular disease. This is mainly due to the increased or impaired lipid uh, levels. They have tend to have high cholesterol levels, high LDL levels, and high triglyceride levels. But if you treat the nephrotic syndrome, with the resolution of nephrotic syndrome, the lipid levels may stabilize, and thus reducing the cardiovascular risk. So it's advised to advise these patients on a healthy lifestyle, uh, and lifestyle modifications, preferably the heart healthy lifestyle modification, such as uh, physical increasing physical activity and weight reduction. Diet alone will not have an uh, been, uh, have a significant effect on controlling the uh, cholesterol levels. But if the patient's nephrotic syndrome is not resolving, uh, even after three to six months, then of course you can start the patient on statin. But Rather than just starting on statin straight away, you can watch whether you can control the nephrotic syndrome. But if not, if the nephrotic syndrome is persisting for more than three to six months, then there's a place to start the patient on statin. However, if the patient is already having risk factors for cardiovascular disease, he may be having ischemic heart disease, so in view of primary prevention, prevention or he have other secondary risk factors for cardiovascular disease, then of course there's a place of starting statin a little more earlier than 
waiting till the nephrotic syndrome to set. So one important another one important complication is thrombosis. So we should address and prevent these patients from developing thrombosis. It is known that venous as well as arterial thrombosis risk is eight times more when compared to normal patients in, in nephrotic syndrome. This risk is, uh, depends on the degree of albumin, serum albumin. If the patient has le more, less amount of uh, albumin in, in the blood, the risk is more. And sometimes when related to primary nephrotic syndrome, some primary nephrotic syndromes have higher risk, especially the membranous nephropathy has the highest risk of thrombosis out of the other primary nephrotic syndromes. Again, the pathology, why these patients develop nephrotic syndrome, it is theoritized, but not yet proven. Maybe due to the uh, protein loss, the proteins which in, involved in uh, anticoagulations are lost in urine, and there may be some increased activ activation of platelets. So there are few hypotheses uh, is there, but no, nothing is proven yet. So how are we gonna address this thrombosis and prevent it from happening. So there are few studies, but there are no randomized control trial evidence with related to thromboembolism prophylaxis in nephrotic syndrome. So what we can do is we should advise the patient not to bed rest. They should have a normal physical activity should be there. Just because the patient is edematous, he should not rest on the bed for several days, which would aggravate thrombosis. So when are we gonna decide on which patients or when are we gonna start on prophylaxis? As I mentioned earlier, this decision should be taken with related to several factors, especially the degree of hypoalbuminemia. The lesser the albumin in the blood, the more the risk the patient has for thrombosis. And we should also assess the bleeding risk of these patients and the type of nephrotic syndrome should also be uh, considered because if it's a membranous nephropathy, they should, you should have a lower threshold for starting. Uh, prophylaxis, anticoagulants, and other risk factors. So which anticoagulant to start off? There are no randomized controlled trials, but the code, the KDGO guideline will suggest if the patient has a risk of uh, arterial thrombosis, yes, aspirin, there's a place. If there's a risk is more towards the venous thrombosis, you can prefer low molecular weight heparins. And the other direct oral anticoagulant agents, there are no proper studies and the safety during in uh, nephrotic syndrome is not yet fully assessed. So the preferred ones would be low molecular weight or aspirin. And the duration would be till at least till the albumin is up by three or the resolution of nephrotic syndrome. So this is taken off from the KDGO latest guidelines on uh, glomerular disease. You just concentrate, you can concentrate on the green uh, box here where when to start on prophylactic anticoagulants. And if the serum albumin is less than 25, with they suggest any one of the following factors you can consider on starting uh, anticoagulant prophylaxis, which include heavy proteinuria, high, heavy, high BMI, and genetic predisposition to thromboembolism, and several other factors include immobilization. Our next complication and prevention aspect comes to with regard to preventing, uh, preventing infections uh, because they have a high tendency to develop infections. So there, there are suggested uh, methods of prevention which include prophylactic vaccinations, the pneumococcal vaccination, the herpes zoster vaccine and influenza vaccines are advised. And some uh, in the latest guidelines, they will suggest cortium prophylaxis, especially if the patients are, patient is being treated on high dose steroids or any other immunosuppressions. And you have to keep an eye on, because this patient might give, develop uh, other parasitic infections such as hyperinfestation of uh, strongyloids. So keep an eye whether these patients develop ESNF. Of course, you will be, you will have to screen for uh, viral infections such as hepatitis B, C, and HIV. Of course, as a screening, as well as they are, they are one, of the, one of the etiological causes for secondary uh, nephrotic syndrome as well. 
one aspect we are probably getting neglected here is addressing the reproductive health concerns of these patients with nephrotic syndrome. Now, if a patient has nephrotic syndrome and it's a woman who is of childbearing potential, uh, we, we might have started on AC inhibitors and statins and maybe some immunosuppressive drugs if it's a primary nephrotic syndrome such as MMF. And if the patients become pregnant while on these drugs, these drugs are teratogenic. And not only the harm is for the fetus, as well as in an acute uh, nephrotic syndrome, if the patient develops, uh, become pregnant, there's a risk for the patient's kidney as well as for the patient's health. And they are at a high risk of developing eclampsia and preeclampsia. So it's important to address the contraceptive issues in women of childbearing age. We would prefer uh, progesterone related, uh, progesterone based uh, contraceptive methods rather than going for the or combined oral contraceptive pill because it carries a somewhat risk of uh, increased thromboembolism. This is not always for women, for males as well, this should be considered. Assume that this patient was treated with a drug such as MMF, will require contraceptive methods even after stopping these drugs because they are considered to be teratogenic. And especially if the patients are, are to be treated with drugs such as cyclophosphamide, their fertility concerns and advice should be given as well. Right, so how are we gonna monitor our response for our treatment? So as I mentioned earlier, it's important to control the nephrotic syndrome, which would con subsequently control most of the complications and uh, complications that it carries. So we can address the edema by checking the weight and input output of the patient. And the diuretics, we generally start with a higher dose, but if the patient is becoming less edematous, you can consider on cutting down on the, and adjusting the dose of diuretics. And the degree of proteinuria should be monitored. It should uh, be, it can be monitored by quantifying the protein levels. Maybe even a simple a urine ward test will also help but more advanced uh, like urine quantification can be done through urine PCR as well. So what is defined as a complete remission of nephrotic syndrome is to have a proteinuria less than 0.3 grams for 24 hours. So UPCR also less than 0.3. And it's also important to monitor the renal functions as well as if the patients are on immunosuppressive, we should have to monitor and address any complications with related to the immunosuppression as well. So in summary, we discussed that the nephrotic syndrome is characterized by heavy proteinuria, edema and hypoalbuminemia. And there are primary and secondary nephrotic syndromes. And in an adult setting, biopsy is mandatory to come to a diagnosis, with, especially with related to primary nephrotic syndromes. And with related to general principles of management of nephrotic syndrome is what we discussed here. And those include symptomatic control mainly, and the ideal therapeutic drug would be the loop diuretics. If resistant to that second line diuretic can be considered, and it's still resistant, loop diuretics uh, with concurrent IV albumin given at least half an hour before the diuretics would enhance the amount of diuresis in these patients and uh, help us in controlling edema. And it's so, we also discussed the prevention of uh, preventive aspects of complications with related to nephrotic syndrome, the thromboembolism prophylaxis based on the degree of hypoalbuminemia and the bleeding risk and other risk factors involved. You can select on a, a preferred uh, anticoagulant agent and give as a prophylaxis for preventing from babies. It's also important to address the infect, infection risks. So uh, prophylactic vaccinations and prophylactic and, uh, and anti, uh, antibiotics such as cotrim with related to preventing uh, PCP if the patient is on high, uh, high level, high degree of immunosuppression is also considered. And to address the cardiovascular risks, it's important to control the uh, lipid levels in these patients, but if it's not settling with the resolution of nephrotic syndrome, uh, 
you can watch for three to six months and if not the patient should be on statin therapy and not to forget to address the reproductive health and concerns of the patients with related to pregnancy and contraception should also be addressed my uh, discussion was based mainly on the KDGO guidelines this is on 2021 related to glomerular uh, nephritis and thank you thank you very much manjula uh, for the excellent presentation it was very informative and there were there are no uh, questions message so we have time for one question and if there is anybody can unmute the mic and start ask the question Uh, Dr. Manucha, uh, you said when the, uh, the loop diaries don't work, you can start on uh, the, the, the thiazides. Is there any particular thiazide that they prefer? Uh, you can, preferred would be the long-acting thiazides, but uh, even uh, this HCT is also uh, preferred. Sir. Any advantage of uh, metalazone over XCT? Uh, metalazone, mm, I haven't uh, come across in comparison of these things, but uh, in practical setting, I think metalazone have better, uh, met better, uh, better outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is one question like coming up. We see some patients with chronic inflammatory uh, infection example rheumatoid arthritis tb with hypoalbuminemia and proteinuria without much renal impairment with, with renal impairment and they are resistant to above treatment uh, what are your thoughts well we have to check whether they have nephrotic syndrome or not and uh, it, it could be some other causes contributing because uh, as I mentioned, there are numerous causes, secondary causes, which can cause nephrotic syndrome. So ideally, if there is a nephrotic range protein and if it is persisting despite uh, treatment of the current illness, in these patients, it's actually beneficial if we can go ahead with the renal biopsy, provided even, even, even having a normal renal function, but if the proteinuria is persistent, and while you control the secondary, uh, the primary cause such as rheumatoid arthritis or TB, if they are still having proteinuria, I would, uh, we would actually prefer going with a renal biopsy and science. Sometimes they may be having underlying primary nephrotic syndromes, which was not detected. Thank, thank you, Manjula. Thank you again. Uh, can we uh, put up his certificate on the screen, please? All right. The, thank you very much, Manjula. On, on behalf of College of Physicians, I wish you all the best in future and hope to Thank see you, you soon again. Right. Thank you.